Welcome to Orbital Dynamics Part 6. In this section, I talk about the celestial sphere and the coordinate system we use to locate objects in space relative to our viewing perspective on the Earth. The most important thing I'm going to cover here with relation to orbital dynamics is the coordinate system we use to locate objects in space. I'm going to define the term right ascension, which I recommend you pay careful attention to. I described in part three the cosmological model that Aristotle developed. His theory explained the motion of objects in the universe. In this model, the Earth was fixed and everything else moved around it. The Pythagoreans, Hecatus, Ecaphantus, and Heraclides proposed that the motion of the stars was apparent, that it was created by rotation of the Earth on an axis. This contradicted Aristotle's model. Most people believed the Earth, that the Earth was fixed. We're all taught about a spinning Earth. It's intuitive. That's the model we ascribe to when we think about the solar system or space in general. When we think locally, however, we still refer to the stars, the moon, and the sun rising and setting and moving across the sky from east to west. All of that thinking has the Earth fixed. Once astronomers discovered how far away things like the sun and stars were, a fixed Earth became nonsensical. The velocities that distant stars would have to travel are inconceivable. Astronomers use a celestial sphere to determine the position of things in space relative to our perspective on Earth. The celestial sphere is an imaginary sphere of arbitrary, arbitrarily large radius concentric with the Earth. That means that the center of the sphere, sphere is the center of the Earth. All objects in the observer sky can be thought of as projected upon the inside surface of a sphere as if it were the underside of a dome or a hemispherical screen. This is a very Earth-centric view, but we're talking about a coordinate system that enables observers on Earth to locate things. This is a coordinate system. It doesn't help us understand the physics or dynamics of things moving in space. Like I said, the celestial sphere coordinate system is centered at Earth's center. The equator of the celestial sphere is in the same plane as the Earth's equatorial plane. I'm showing the equatorial plane tilted here. This is the 23.5 degree tilt of the Earth relative to its orbital plane around the Sun, which is called the plane of the ecliptic. Note the red dot labeled vernal equinox. This is the zero degrees, zero degree reference point for the coordinate system. This is analogous to zero degrees of latitude and zero degrees of longitude. We determine the locations of things in the sky from this reference point. Let me explain each of these concepts in more detail. Here I show the plane of the ecliptic. Notice the Earth orbiting the Sun. This grid I just added is the Earth's orbital plane. That's the plane of the ecliptic. In reality, the Earth orbit wobbles and goes in and out of this plane. This is an apparent path. The plane of the ecliptic is somewhat conceptual and is along the mean or apparent path. Here's the plane of the ecliptic from an Earth perspective. If you look closely, you can see that the Earth's spin axis is tilted 23.5 degrees. Here's the Earth's equatorial plane. This is the equatorial plane for our celestial sphere. Notice that the motion of the sun is not coincident with this plane. It's rising upward. By the way, this animation is sped up considerably. I'm advancing through a month of time in about 30 seconds. Here I show both planes. The sun moves along the red plane of the ecliptic. The Earth spins along the green equatorial plane. The time of this animation is starts at the vernal equinox. The intersection of these two planes forms a line. And notice that it points right at the sun in the very beginning for at least a second. Going back to our celestial sphere diagram, I've just explained the celestial equator and the plane of the ecliptic. 
Next, I wanted to find right ascension and declination. I talked about Erasthenes in part four. He determined the circumference of the Earth. He also developed the system of latitudes and longitudes we use to specify locations on the Earth. Latitude starts at zero degrees at the equator. 10 degrees north is a location on the Earth that is a 10 degree arc higher than the equator. Likewise, 20 degrees north is 20 degrees higher. 10 degrees south and 20 degrees south are below the equator. This sets up a series of parallel lines. Latitude is often referred to as a parallel. The second coordinate, longitude, starts at a prime meridian that intersects with Greenwich, England, chosen for political reasons. That's defined to be zero degrees of long longitude. A 10 degree west longitude is 10 degrees to the left of the prime meridian. A 10 degrees east longitude is 10 degrees to the right. East meets west at the international date line, 180 degrees from the prime meridian. Here's an animation that shows you can locate any point on the Earth with latitude and longitude. And as I move this point around, you can see the latitude and the longitude shifting. To the right, you can see the prime meridian that goes through Greenwich, England. This is close to the zero, zero point. And notice what happens when I move the point to the equator. The longitude becomes ambiguous. The reference point for latitude and longitude started at Greenwich, England for political reasons. In 1884, the United States hosted the International Meridian Conference, attended by representatives from 25 nations. 22 of them agreed to adopt the longitude of the Royal Observatory in Greenwich, England as the zero reference line. The Dominican Republic voted against the motion while France and Brazil abstained. That defined the prime meridian, which is the zero degree longitude point. The most natural reference for latitude was the Earth's equator. If you take the intersection of the prime meridian and the equator, you end up at this point off the west coast of Africa. This is the zero zero reference point for latitude and longitude. There are a similar set of coordinates for the celestial sphere. In this animation, the units are azimuth and altitude. Azimuth is a horizontal angle of the celestial object. Altitude is the angle from the equatorial plane to the celestial object. It's easier to see in this animation. The little stick figure person would be standing at the North Pole. The green disk is the equatorial plane. Locations on the celestial sphere are measured in degrees of angle. A change in the of angle and azimuth moves along the equator, a change of angle and elevation moves up or down relative to the equator. This works pretty much like latitude and longitude with one difference. The Earth spins within the celestial sphere, so these two coordinate systems change relative to each other. In part four, I mentioned that Hipparchus discovered and measured the precession of the equinoxes. It occurs because of the wobble of the Earth's spin axis. In this graphic, you can see an autumnal equinox point and a vernal equinox point. They point to constellations in the sky. The vernal equinox point was chosen as the reference for the meridian of the celestial sphere. The scale on the lower right starts at 1900 BC and goes to 2000 AD. Over the past 4,000 years, the point in the sky that the vernal equinox points to has been changing. In fact, it's been changing since the Earth started to wobble on its axis. The vernal equinox point as seen from Earth currently points to the constellation Pisces. It's referred to, ironically, as the first point of Aries. Here's another graphic that shows the precession of the vernal equinox point. It used to point to Aries and now points to Pisces. Many years ago, this was called the first point of Aries and the name stuck. By the way, look carefully at this animation again. The vernal equinox point will someday point to the constellation Aquarius. If you've ever seen the musical hair, you're familiar with the song Aquarius, Let the Sunshine In. It's actually a compilation of two songs. 
the first song, Aquarius, has a line, this is the dawning of the age of Aquarius, and this is what they were referring to. Here's the video that shows the vernal equinox point at the time of the vernal equinox in 2014. Note that the sun lines up with the zero, zero point on the grid. The vernal equinox is defined by the line that extends from the Earth through the sun at the exact time of the vernal equinox. If I run this animation, you can see that the sun is only at this point for an instant and ultimately moves away. The vernal equinox is not a day of the year, it's an instant in time. Here I'm showing the plane of the ecliptic. This is the plane of the Earth's orbit around the sun. And then here's the Earth's equatorial plane. And here are both planes. Notice that the vernal equinox point is also defined by the line segment that extends along the intersection of the equatorial plane and the plane of the ecliptic. Let's look at a simpler diagram. The central body here is the sun. The disk is the plane of the ecliptic. I've inserted it in Earth. Its equatorial plane is tilted 23.5 degrees with respect to the plane of the ecliptic. Here's another view. Note the line of intersection between the Earth's equatorial plane and the plane of the ecliptic. This orientation would be a solstice. And here's an orientation during an equinox. If this were the vernal equinox, the line from the Earth to the Sun points to the first point of Aries in the constellation Pisces. Here's another graphic that shows this. Here I'm showing both these orientations. Notice that the line of intersection between the plane of the ecliptic and the two equatorial planes points in the same direction. The celestial sphere meridian reference point is located by that line formed by the intersection of the Earth's equatorial plane and the plane of the ecliptic. I showed you an animation that located objects in the sky with azimuth and elevation. In astronomy, the units have different names. Azimuth is called right ascension, elevation is called declination. Here the observer little stick figure is fixed in location and time. I can, change, I can change the location of the star and the parameters for right ascension and declination change. Then if I change the latitude of the observer, the right ascension and declination remain constant. The same is true if I change the sidereal time. In astronomy, right ascension is expressed as an hour angle. In orbital dynamics, we express right ascension in degrees. The measure of right ascension is along the equator and is the angle from the vector that points to the first point of Aries in the constellation Pisces. Here, in this animation, I show both perspectives, one in space on the left and one is an observer on Earth. I'm gonna show three stellar constellations, the Big Dipper, Orion, and the Southern Cross. And here I can change the observer's location and I can advance his or her time. When I start the animation, the Earth starts spinning. On the right, you can see that the constellations are rising and setting. On the left, you can see the Earth spinning while the stars are fixed. And if I put the observer at the north, the constellation Orion stays on the horizon. Likewise, the same is true if I put the observer at the south. If I put the observer in the northeast of the US, you can see Orion rises and sets along an oblique angle, the Big Dipper is visible, and the Southern Cross is not. Where does the term right ascension come from? Here's what Wikipedia says. An old term, right ascension refers to the ascension or the point on the celestial equator that rises with any celestial object as seen from Earth's equator where the celestial equator intersects the horizon at a right angle. It contrasts with oblique ascension, the point on the celestial equator that rises with any celestial object as seen from most latitudes on Earth where the celestial equator intersects the horizon at an oblique angle. That's pretty complicated, so let me explain this more simply. In this animation, I'm gonna put the observer at zero degrees north and zero degrees west. From this perspective, the celestial equator intersects the horizon at a right angle. I'm showing the constellations Orion, the Big Dipper, and the Southern Cross. 
Orion's path is on the celestial equator, and you can see that its path intersects the horizon at a right angle. Now look at all three constellations. The location where they ascend on the horizon is the right ascension, and it's measured as an angle from the first point of Aries of the constellation Pisces. If I change the location of the observer, the celestial equator is now at an oblique angle to the horizon. The Big Dipper is in constant view. The Southern Cross is never seen. And there's only an ascension for Orion. If I move closer to the equator, you see both constellations ascending and descending. But those ascension points are not the right angles for the right ascension. Here's a graphic from Wikipedia that depicts this. I want to say a little something about the celestial sphere. This animation shows a more, real, more realistic location of the stars in the Big Dipper. They're not the same distance from Earth. That's what the night sky looks to us, but their, their distances are actually different. So the celestial sphere is a very Earth-centric model. There's a neat trick you can do to tell time. If you know the date of the year, the line from the North Star to the edge of the Big Dipper forms an hour hand. And as time progresses, you can tell the time in a kind of counterclockwise clock. Now note when the time of year changes, the orientation of the clock changes. But otherwise, on any given night, that line's going to move like an hour hand. I've been showing you 3D models of the Earth, Sun, and Moon. I want to t talk a bit about how we commonly look at the Earth, the Mercator projection. The Mercator projection is a cylindrical map projection presented by the Flemish geographer and cartographer Gerardus Mercator in 1569. It became the standard map projection for nautical purposes because of its ability to represent lines of constant course, known as rum lines, as straight segments. The linear scale is constant in all directions around any point, thus preserving the angles and shapes of small objects. The Mercator projection, however, distorts the size and shape of large objects as the scale increases from the equator to the poles, where it becomes infinite. A spherical Earth is projected onto a cylinder. Both the width and height are exaggerated up north and down south. The proportions around the equator are about right. Sadly, our perception of the Earth is largely based on a Mercator projection. We visualize a distorted Earth. On maps, we're familiar with what Greenland looks like. On, on maps, we're familiar with Greenland looks about the size of Australia, when Australia is actually three times bigger. There's a sailing race that goes around the world. It's for single-handed sailors and is very popular in Europe. As seen on a Mercator projection, it looks like the course is actually around the world. Here's what it looks like on a polar projection. It's really a race around Antarctica, not around the world. A true race around the world is one that would go through the Panama and Suez canals, and it would actually be a much easier course. The course around Antarctica takes competitors down below the 40th parallel into what's called the Roaring Forties, where there are very strong westerly winds caused by west to east air currents from air being displaced from the equator towards the South Pole and due to the Earth's rotation. There are very few land masses that serve as wind breaks. You can shorten the distance by sailing closer to Antarctica. However, you get into what's called the screaming 60s, where winds get up to 90 miles per hour and waves get up to 50 feet. And there's icebergs. Here's an animation that depicts the illumination on the Earth during various times of the year. This depicts a change in the length of day and night over various times of the year. From this, it's hard to figure out what's going on physically. The equinoxes make sense where the sun lines are vertical, but the rest of the year looks kind of odd. This is an animation I used previously. It demonstrates the changes in the lengths of the day during various seasons. This is very intuitive and shows what's really going on. This, I maintain, gives you a much better intuition about the changes 
in the lengths of days and nights over the year and why they occur. Here's an animation that projects a satellite orbiting the Earth and which parts of the Earth are in sunlight and in the dark. This is projected on a Mercator projection that we're very familiar with, but I would defy you to develop any kind of intuition for how these motions are taking place. Here's the same animation in 3D, by the way this is sped up considerably. The change in daylight and dark is a simple effect caused by the rotation of the Earth. The orbiting satellite is moving relative to the Earth's sphere with no apparent correlation to the spin of the Earth. From this, you can develop a proper intuition of the dynamics of this orbiting satellite. In orbital dynamics, we not only don't have a lot of use for Mercator projections, they're counterproductive. We usually model orbits and then as a last step, we'll project them on a Mercator map. In this part, while I debunk the notion of stars and planets actually traveling within celestial spheres, I introduce the concept of, of a celestial sphere that can be used to locate celestial objects. The most important concept I introduce is the right ascension. There's a there's a term in orbit, that's a term in orbital dynamics that we use frequently right ascension, and we use it in a broader term, right ascension of the ascending node. So it's thus important to know what right ascension means. 